Um, but the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, run through um, run through a quick kind of lens um, for someone who's been living in Boulder, grew up in the area, but working globally on these things, and uh, talk a little bit about um, how it feels and what one sees when one's been watching some of the resilience debates globally and what's happening. And yet, there's a messy reality of water running down your street. It's always happened, I've always been in other places where it's happened. So, the, uh, that's why we wanted to do this. We were hoping out of this um, talk to send a couple of key messages around what works and what's, what's really important to look at. But we're also hoping um, to get sets of relationships going. There's a lot going on globally in other cities, where there's, in places like Durban in South Africa, where we've been, got great contacts, or in Da Nang in Vietnam, where we have great contacts. It's really exciting, that is very different about how cities can approach things. Um, and we think that's very relevant, that there's a huge amount that a place like Boulder can learn. And there's a huge amount that we have to offer. We're kind of in our bubble here um, of, of what we're used to doing in the US context, but there are lots of things going on elsewhere. So part of the reason for holding this tonight was to, to get some of the usual folks out, and I see some of the usual folks here, and get some other types out as well, um, have a little bit of a wider dialogue around what works, what doesn't, and also have some fun. There's gonna be some good music afterwards, and we really appreciate the, uh, the rail splitters for coming. And um, again, you know, if you feel hungry or thirsty, Shine is really supporting us by having this, so uh, letting us creep in here as a, as a non-profit. And uh, so anything that you order from them would be appreciated and help them out in doing this work. So, you know, you look at this, this is, this is just our street, and I'm sure a million, and you've seen a million and one of these pictures. But it was very intriguing, standing there on the front step, watching the water come up and going, hmm, this is familiar. It's not here. You know, um, we were the only ones on our street, I think, to have flood insurance. We didn't get flooded. But we were the only ones who sort of accessed that. People really weren't thinking about this. And we weren't really thinking about it as being different. But we were aware of a huge thing that happens everywhere, and that is, you think about fires, and the next thing you'll do is get floods or a heat thing or an electricity failure. It's not what you were expecting. It's always something different. And so we were thinking about that as, you know, as we looked down our street and looked at what people were doing, and you know, here we are debating, the water's in the street, that's fine. If you went down the street, there was a common behavior everywhere. Water doesn't come into my house. Water goes in the public space. Nobody wants water in their house. And that was a huge behavioral organizing factor. People doing a million and one things. And that has actually continued. People say that disaster response, people stop responding a year, a little less afterwards, or they don't respond at the household level. It's bullshit. They actually do a lot of response. And you can see it in things that aren't always positive for everybody. It's things like flood gardening, what I call flood gardening, changing your garden so that it doesn't flood. But it has a unifying factor, and it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, Boulder or India, it's water goes in the public space, it doesn't go in my house. And that's even more so with sewer. Very few people really want sewer in their house. And it's a unifying behavioral feature that I think we tend to forget. You know, I have yet to meet somebody who does. So next slide. This is this is a house just down the street from us. You know, it's not anything like Lyons or Jamestown, but they actually have to rescue people out of this house. And it's really interesting, as you'll see a little later, to look at what's happening with this house. Next slide. So it's those reflections during the flood that I've been thinking about. Of, you know, sitting there in the house, watching these behaviors. Everybody who works on floods has heard about communications fascinating sitting there. We knew exactly what was going on on our street. You could hear the sirens on the creek 
but you had no idea what was happening between you and the creek. And you didn't really know what was happening in the creek. And then we had some very good indications of what was happening upstream for us, mostly because there were the contents of people's garages floating by. You know, it was, it was kind of a tangible evidence that, you know, they're not having a good time up there. But we had no idea about the scale in the rest of the county, and that's classic. Now, we, you know, when we talk about this, we've heard a lot about Twitter, we've heard a lot about other types of social media and communications, and a lot of that was going on. And we were getting information coming, flowing in, but the thing I was aware of, that people tend to forget, here, is all of that depends on energy. Absolute fundamental dependence on the energy system to keep going. And if we hadn't had our power, we wouldn't have had our electricity. And without our electricity, we don't have communications. And without communications, all those things in the modern social networking thing fall apart. So we tend to focus on communications, but underlying that is the nature of what our power grid is. And that, of course, relates to another debate that we've been having here, which is municipalization. I won't go into that, but the whole point of when is it reliable, how reliable is it critically, is out of sight, out of mind. And that was one of the reflections that I was having as this flood was happening, of just thinking, you know, I can see what's happening, I can see where people are behaving, but underneath it, I'm also aware of the different systems. And the other thing is, when you think about that picture of the house, everywhere in the world, the roads wash out. Water, when it's moved out of the public space, private space goes into the public space and that public space is usually the road and when it's going up in a residential neighborhood that's where it's pushed when it's coming down the canyon of course you build the road down the canyon and it washes out now two months before we had the floods in Boulder there were similar floods in the Indian Himalaya we were lucky we had a tremendous tragedy people killed they had 1500 people killed maybe. 100,000 people displaced. People were trapped there. There were, they had tens of helicopters taking people out, and there was huge sense of social displacement because they were mostly taking tourists out, and not the people who needed, it, not others. So we were lucky, but the same dynamics of transport, we had access to resources, the same dynamics were central. So when I think of resilience, and I think of that, in under there is going the you know, we've got these social networks going, but they're enabled by power. We've got response of capacities going, the helicopters going, but they're enabled by a whole institutional system that we don't really think about on a daily basis and that other people don't have. And how are people coping in other areas? Next slide. So I'd say, you know, if I look at Boulder and I think about resilience in general, many things work. It wasn't the flood that we expected. The water system almost went out. The sewer system almost went out. And that's not widely public knowledge. I think it was six days running just on the skin of the teeth to keep Patasa going and bringing in diesel. If you look at the sewer system, we have one big pipe that was washing out in the middle of the night to the main treatment plant. If both of those had gone, we would have been like lions. But they didn't go. And they didn't go not because of the physical nature of the system, but because in the case of Potasso, the county people and the municipality knew the fire departments, and the fire departments had connections with them because of the previous fires. And when they were running out of diesel for the Potasso water supply plant, they were able to call the fire departments and get them to bring diesel down the hill or truck it up in different ways when the roads were washing. So it was initiative. It was that kind of sparky, crazy thing you're not planning for, it, but you've got some systems in place, some relationships in place. Same with, with the sewer system. Getting people out there at midnight to make a cradle around the main sewer pipe, leading to it, that's not something you plan for. That's not going to happen. You put a broom around the sewer system, fine. But it wasn't the physical system. It was the social response in there. And that, to me, is a core thing that comes through about resilience everywhere. Relationships matter. It's not just about having community, your neighbors, and, you know, and places that have sprung back. In Lyons, there's been a huge involvement of the, of the music community. There's been a huge involvement of others. And this is typical globally. It's when you know somebody, have a passion for them, feel, know them, have relationships. When we looked at it in India, the places that sprang back 
were all about places that actually had community relationships. You could just measure it by the number of organizations. And it was often mothers' groups, small credit groups. It was a farmers' co-op. Had nothing to do with disaster at all. But it was people who knew each other and people who knew systems. So when you look at San Francisco and they say, how did we spring back after the late 80s earthquake? Well, it was because they had systems and they also had a direct tap to Washington, D.C. and they got resources. And that system was critical. But those were based on relationships. They just bypassed the state. They skied right bypassed the state, grabbed on resources at the, at the federal level, and were moving. And then when the state finally got its wheels going, they said, well, you know, we've got most of it, but you should you give us a couple hundred million extra to deal with it. But it's those relationships. And it's relationships in communities, between businesses and people, between sectors, between the fire departments and the water resource department, things that we don't, between the county and the city. So these things are common global. So many things really did work from my perspective. But, next slide, how much of it was luck? You know, there was an awful lot of luck that we didn't lose more people. There was an awful lot of luck that they were able to get extra diesel to potassium. You know, it takes about a week to reprime a water system. You don't have the water in it. You, know, you can imagine people trekking down to Boulder Creek during the flood to get jerry cans of water and taking it off their roof. They probably would have done that. But, but you know, when you, when you lose a critical system like that after a bit, people can't really stay there, and especially if the sewer system goes. So in all of that, depending on the power, if you, diesel is power. So your power system resilience is absolutely critical. And a lot of it was luck. A lot of it was luck. And that's characteristic of many areas. Next slide. And as I think, you know, I've issued, mentioned on this, these are really common issues globally. Um, you can do a lot with planning. You can do a lot with forethought. But at the end of the day, it's, some of it is about your absolutely most important fundamental systems, your communications, water, uh, power, transport. Are those going to stay up under a variety of, of situations? And some of it is about just relationships, people knowing each other, being able to respond, and having a lot of luck. But you've got to be positioned to take advantage of luck. You've got to be flexible. You've got to be willing. So I think a lot of it was luck. And to me, there's a place where Boulder has a huge amount to learn. When we look at how things are recovering, there's a place where we're building back. And maybe we're building back better. But there are also places where we're building the same sorts of vulnerabilities. And there's also a lot of places where we're building in response to the disaster that just happened. And not thinking about what the next sets of stresses might be, even if they're bloody obvious if you think about it. You know, um, read work that people uh, in I said have just been involved in looks at temperature in, in central India. You're going to have heat stress at a level you can't believe. Northern India had massive rolling blackouts of power, riots over power strikes. And so the whole question of, you know, this isn't something we're thinking about centrally. Maybe it's something else. Uh, I remember a talk by the deputy director of FEMA at the Natural Hazards a few years ago about the drechos, the windstorms that went through D.C., and how they couldn't supply the supermarkets because there are thousands of producers and thousands of supermarkets, but there are only three distributors, and all of those depend on the barcodes, and if the barcodes aren't being scanned, there's no demand signal. So everything was being shipped off to Chicago instead of coming to the D.C. area. So there are these hidden systems in under there that we don't tend to think about, but that actually may be where some of our fragility lies. And we, we focus on the immediate flood, but do we have an awareness of those? And I think that's where we have a lot to learn globally. So, next slide. So we work primarily across Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, um, some in Pakistan, and that's where a lot of kind of our anecdotes and things like that come. Um, ICED is a, is a research group and a support group, group for cities that have been uh, doing resilience planning in very, very different contexts. And I'm always amazed about how they're very different contexts, but actually they're quite similar in some ways. You know, um, 
there's a very basic similarity around politics. There's a very basic similarity around the way systems function. We have different sets of assumptions and different sets of, of infrastructure. Next slide. And this would be a typical situation in central India. You know, um, this is in Gorakhpur where we've been working. Um, tremendous flooding happened. But there's been transformation. This looks poor. But since 1990, when I first went through this area in 93, they have gone from houses that are built at ground level through houses that are now raised one to three meters. And if you do your climate modeling, which people have done, it actually means that they're unlikely to be flooded inside the house. Now, it's not solving the problem. But it does mean that they don't lose their rice every year. It means that they don't lose their sewing machine every year. People are doing little things, like putting a pump with water up to their roof, like making sure that they have a solid roof where they can move stuff to. It's very tiny, but it's the same behavioral pattern that we see here when people do flood gardens. And it's transformed their vulnerability. It's small, and very importantly, it's in the action space where people can act themselves because that was one of the things that came out most clearly in recent surveys by Boko Strong in, in this area. A lot of people, the basic response was at the community level, at the household level. What are they doing? They're thinking about preparedness for themselves. There's a real limit to what government can do. It's really evident that there's a limit in places like India. But here it's also very evident. If you're a mountain community person, you know you've got to be prepared yourself. And that is where a lot of that action takes place, is at the household level. And we tend to ignore that in life, is that behavioral incentive. Next slide. And what are they doing? So this would be a typical thing. Yeah, you know, it doesn't look fancy, but they've put up higher roofs. They've raised the plinth level, as I said, by you know, one to three meters. And if you think that's 30% of the household cost for a place like that, it's a huge investment by individuals. Here, I know individuals, some of them sitting in this room, who, uh, you know, not put in drywall in their basement because that might well get knocked out next time, making sure they have a sump pump. That's the same thing. Some local, individually driven behavior so that they don't lose it. Next slide. So it's the space where households can act, and I think that that's a tremendous part of resilience and adaptation that we tend to forget. Okay? Here is another thing that they're doing. This is a design competition, household flood resilient design competition that we held in Vietnam. And there was local architects looking at local initiatives. And how do we design houses that are far less flood resilient? I mean, far more flood resilient. In that case, typhoon resilient. They like to have it, you know, they, they were thinking about getting the insurance payment, so they wanted it to wash out every year. Uh, no, um, but no, it was, the whole idea was, how do we do it? Um, but what was innovative about this is, the design changes aren't rocket science. What was innovative is that they aren't rocket science. That they are small things that people can live with, that are standard parts, little bits of changes. And if you think about the same thing here, we know a lot of areas in Boulder are flood prone. Why do we put our utilities in the basement? You, know, you want to replace the utilities? You want to have them out? That's one of the largest costs. Um, you know, there are micro changes like that that tremendously transform risk and impact. Yeah, another one would be that's slightly larger scale. Why do we think of having a standard sewer utility? In places in South Asia, in other places, they're talking about having distributed waste drain, composting toilets is the standard thing. Think of it as waste disposal coming, you know, the, the regular waste disposal truck coming once a month, picking up a blue cube, taking it for, for treatment. Now, the neat thing about that is they're doing it there because they can't afford to run the pipes out. Here, it means the whole system wouldn't wash out in a flood, but it also means we wouldn't be demanding water in a drought. And it also means, if you look at it from a different kind of sustainability perspective, that the fish down below the uh, treatment plant wouldn't be jumping extra high after everybody's drunk their coffee and all the caffeine is floating out. You know, so you look at the Colorado River, loaded with hormones, loaded with antibiotics. There are some very different models that we don't even entertain. And that we don't know if it would be work. Right now, composting toilets are illegal in Boulder because they're like your grandmothers, great-grandfathers, uh, outhouse. They're very different models. But there are things that we take for granted that we assume that would be different. So 
there are some things that are out of the box. If you look at the uh, if you look at the flood resilient housing, the other innovation is they have a financing mechanism. And if you look at flood recovery here, it was micro grants for flood for that. If you look at flood recovery here, and you talk about the people who are missing, the people who we don't hear about that much, who are still struggling. We've got friends who were burned out up in Gold Hill, came down, settled in a house here, and got absolutely washed out. They're struggling to find resources. In Vietnam, they came up with a micro loan program, and that's what's finding. Lots to learn. Next. This is the same house that was being washed out. You notice the flood garden? They got a nice little burn right here. That's going on up and down the streets. You can see it in millions of ways. You walk up and down uh, 9th Street just here, and you look at the uh, place clutter. They've got nice little floodgates on each door. That's happening at that level. It costs about probably, they probably spent $100 on floodgates. This probably spent, oh, probably, it was probably five or 6,000 bucks worth of landscaping, but they lost probably a year and a half of rent. And they sort of say, well, and it's, water is not going into the private space again, it's going into the public space. And the road designer better think that actually that's a behavior thing. That'll happen. Next slide. Similarly, down on Arapaho Avenue, this was washed in lots and lots. I think they had about 40 apartments flooded out. Now it's going to a burn. It's happening in every single place if you have your eyes open for it. I'm not saying if it's good or bad. It's got some, got some negatives to it. Because every time you block water one place, it goes somewhere else. But it is a huge behavior. Next slide. Places like Vietnam or India, they don't even need to live with water. So, and this is standard, you know, various standard designs. Some of it's old, some of it's modern. Next slide. So how do we think about it? We think about it in terms of getting people to learn together. Shared learning is critical. If we're going to do anything, it's got to have a basis of bringing together those behaviors, as well as the analysis that the states is so focused on. We also have to think about those systems. The power systems, others, the ecosystems that are the foundation. We have to think about who the people and organizations are and what their incentives are. And we have to think about what our, what our exposure is. In this case, it's, it's climate. And we have to think about our laws and regulations. This is something like the floodplain regulations. This is where people are trying to work through. What you want to do is you want to think about this stuff, and then you want to do things about it. In systems, you need to build them so that they're flexible, redundant, modular. As we say, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket, you know, or uh, whatever. For your people, it's the question, do they have the incentives to learn from the last one? They tend to fight the last battle. You know, can we get resources? Do we have capacity? For a lot of the institutions, is do we have access to the information? Do we know? I mean, a lot of people don't even know what's happening up, up and down. So, we see this as cyclical processes of learning, where if you can get that going, you might actually do something. Next slide. And we think of it very clearly in terms of those three things, the systems, the people, and the, the rules that they tend to run by, the norms. And with the people, it's that question of relationships. What's the glue that is often absolutely fundamental? With the systems, it's often questions of, do they fall apart? Do they fail safely? Do they last when they're going? Next. So, yeah, think about it as design, prioritize, implement, identify. Think about the systems in terms of their flexibility, their redundancy, the fate safe failure. Think about the people in terms of resourcefulness, responsiveness, that critical piece which worked so well during the floods of people just being able to come out and respond. Resor can, and can they get the resources? Do they have the authority to act to, around them? That sort of thing. These are the pieces that we see as about being around resilience. And it is, at the core, those institutional things as well. Access to information, you know, the ability to access places, to access resources decision-making structures, are they open? Do you get enough engagement, or are people just sitting off in their corner feeling left out? Next slide. And we see it as hierarchical. 
You can think of it, without ecosystems and protection, you have nothing. Without energy, you lose your water, your food, your, your transport and communications. Without transport, communications, and shelter, you lose a lot of your social networks, your public security, your education, your credit, all those things. So your adaptive capacity really de depends on that foundation of critical systems. Or you can flip it. Next slide. Next. One. Just to think of it as a foundation in the other way, that a whole lot of the top level of society depends on those fundamental systems and their operations. It is about human relations, but in a modern network society, a lot of those human relations are enabled by systems that we don't even think about. And it's also where places like South Asia can teach us a lot. My cell phone is about 200 times more expensive than it is in Nepal. When I get a cell phone in Nepal, I can, for $2 or $10, I can spend, call the U.S. for about, a, about two weeks in a trip. They're, the poorest people can call back work and pay so much higher. It's the question of access, penetration, things like that, that it lends flexibility. Next slide. So, you know, we're people. It's relationships, capacities, the ability to learn, access to resources, social justice. Do people feel active? excluded and one of the pieces that we do have here in Boulder is this this debate there's a lot of people who are affected who aren't part of the dialogue so next slide so are we really resilient I'd say yes and no next slide much remains very unclear you know, we are building systems but we don't actually know where the fra fragilities are we're responding a lot to the last disaster, but we're not thinking about some of the other types of things that could affect us. Um, we have a lot of flexibility, we have a lot of relationships, but we also have a very transient, disconnected society where people are often excluded in little bubbles. So those are real challenges, as I think Gary and, and people from the city can attest to too. There's sets of relationships between the city and the county, and there are places where they don't talk. It may be even weaker between the city, county, and the state, you know, in terms of a, a lot of those. And yet our systems run across those boundaries. And that's one of the things that we have a tremendous challenge dealing with everything. Next slide. Core message to me, Boulder has a lot to share. There's a lot going on here, tremendous innovation. But we also have a lot to learn, and there's innovation in unexpected places. And there's often been the model that we have the knowledge, what do we have to learn? There's a huge amount of innovation in other areas. Next slide. So we need that innovation. And next one. And, you know, to me, the ways forward in this part of the innovation is not to say we've got a grand solution. When you talk about having neighborhood block parties, that doesn't have like much of a solution. It's what Longmont is doing. But it's getting to know people. It's a 1% solution. If you talk about having more distributed energy, well, that doesn't really solve your question of access of people. But on the other hand, it does solve a big piece of things fall apart. So it's many, many, many partial solutions. It's things that create glue, things that add layers of, of support in there that are important. It's also, now if you look at the debate over the Scottish referendum right now, one of the big differences is Scotland is a very private sector place, but it's got a social compact around what it wants business to do, and it distrusts the rest of the UK because the city is really about making money first. At least that's how it's often framed by the Scots. And so there's a huge thing of where we can say, you know, a lot of this innovation, if we can tap it, will kick us over the top, and we'll do well, but we'll do good at the same time. Or we'll do good, and by doing that, we'll do well. And that's around things like the innovation around solar, it's around all sorts of little things, whether it's the biking community, other things, alternative modes of transport, and that's one of our wells of things. We need some resilient systems, but resilience doesn't mean stay stuck. It doesn't mean just keep your, concert, your place as you were. It is also about transforming. And there are debates about transforming our energy systems. There could be debates about transforming our water. We may need a debate about how do we transform community relations in a rapidly changing social context. We don't have those. 
And another piece, to me, is emphasize those commonalities. As I said before, I don't know very many people from any political stripe who like to have the sewer come into their house. There's a huge commonality there. There's a lot of people who don't like water in their house. You know, it's, um, it's not a political division, and you'll find a lot of those things. So I see critical places in that. Next slide, and I think I'm just about done. So what my key message is kind of out of the global context uh, would be, would be, we have a lot to share, we have a lot to learn. We've almost always been fighting the last battle. Let's try and think ahead a little bit. You know, we've got some of the best minds on climate in this town. We also have some amazing minds on transport, on change, etc. We've got a real opportunity there. Third thing is relationships matter. You know, we're more and more in a wired world, but it really makes a sense to know who your neighbor is, and it makes a sense to know who your colleagues are even if they're not exactly in your discipline. So it's not just about the community, the neighborhood. It is about at, at different level. Third thing is to recognize that we depend on these really complex systems and to realize that when complex systems thing should happen, we don't know where it's coming from, it's going to be a surprise. And so think about, do we have some backups for some of the things that we really care about most? You know, third, it is really important to plan. You know, you look at the Boulder floodway, it made a difference, but it was only a 25-year flood, maybe there. It is important to plan. You don't ignore the obvious. But surprise is inevitable, so make sure that you have those other things in place. Third thing which I think is really evident in Asia is individual behavior counts a lot. People do a lot for themselves, and so recognizing that sense. And final thing that's absolutely central is to say that you know those without an effective voice get left behind. You know, and it's the question of of you know um, often the friend of mine in Nepal characterizes it this way that politicians don't move where they see the light, they move where they feel the heat. Now we have a lot of far sighted politicians, but it's true that a little bit of supporting pressure helps tremendously. Um, with the far-sighted, and, and it is essential for the less far-sighted. So uh, those things. So this is this is kind of the way I wanted to frame this, and then I wanted to invite um, four kind of people who've been involved here at different levels up to talk. Patty Romero-Lenko, who has worked globally and is from NCAR on a lot of climate things, just to say some words. Gary here, who's with the the with the county and has been leading a lot of the uh, the flood recovery. Brett Kincaren has been standing in the back looking rayfish and, and trying to... <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, he's looking like a typical Boulder citizen. Um, <laughs> um, who's been thinking a lot about sustainability for the city. And finally, Karen McLuhan, who's a colleague at ISAT who did the Boulder case study here. And really brought home a lot of what I've said comes out of her work and out of the work that she and Chris jointly did on that case study. Um, so I would, wanted to invite each of them to just you know, take five minutes, say a few comments, and then we'll open it up for discussion, questions, um, and you let us know if this is valuable or if it's you know, another talking hand. And then we'll shift to the music, which I think is a core part of that community element. And I think that's why I wanted to bring it in, and I really appreciate the rail splitters for doing that. So, Patty, others.